اثنين من اهم الاصوات الدوليه في سوريا المعاصره. It is indeed a great honor to welcome you all on behalf of the Syrian, the Syrian Solidarity Collective at the University of Toronto to this extraordinary event with Nassim al and Wendy Perlman. Syria, revolution between the war on terror and the refugee crisis. My name is Jens Hansen. I've been teaching Arabic civilization and modern Middle East history here at the University of Toronto since 2001. And I've lived and studied in Damascus intermittently throughout the 1990s. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that our meeting tonight takes place on the lands of the Hero Mandat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River have called their home for thousands of years before Europeans have expropriated this, their territory. Toronto is still the home to many indigenous people across Turtle Island. We acknowledge that we, who are non-indigenous, are beneficiaries of Canada's settler colonial past and present and therefore stand in unconditional solidarity with our brothers and sisters who seek to dismantle this system and make this country a place of equal opportunity for all. The Syria Solidarity Collective is grateful for the financial support of the Department of Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations, the Institute of Islamic Studies, and hopefully soon, the Department of History. Their generosity has gone a long way to break freedom. We are also honored to have received public endorsement from the Department of Near Middle Eastern Civilization's formidable <coughs> and famous student group, the NMC Cultural Exchange and Support Initiative, which has been offering young Syrian newcomers opportunities to receive English language training from and offer Arabic language training to UT students. A big shout out also to fellow activists with uh, No One Is Illegal, Indigenous Land Defense Across Borders, No More Silence Toronto, who have all publicly endorsed this event and the work that we have been doing. We launched the Syria Solidarity Collective in 2014, and on March of that year, one of our comrades was killed in a barrel bomb attack in Aleppo. I would like to take this moment to commemorate the life of the journalist, photographer, and friend, Mustafa Ali, who died documenting the atrocities of the Assad regime. The Syria Solidarity Collective is an anti-oppression group which strives for social justice for people in Syria, including class justice and gender justice. We oppose sectarianism and colonialism. We endeavor to reach out to those Syrians who are struggling both against the Assad regime and against the reactionary forces attempting to co-opt their struggle. We seek to understand and support representative and participatory institution building towards a society that practices democracy from below. We believe that Syria's future cannot begin until the Assad dynasty <coughs> has been dismantled and Syria's sovereignty has been re-established. The Assad family has ruled over Syria for 50 years, and, as Yassin Hash Saleh has argued, still deploys the rhetoric of eternity. The nationwide, peaceful, and ecumenical uprising in 2011 has shaken the Assadist personalization of the Syrian state to the core. The revolution signaled to the world that there was another subaltern Syria beneath decades of martial law and mass incarceration, a, creative, a, 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 a courageous and generous Syria. The regime could only maintain the Shamira of eternity by conducting a total war on the Syrian people, killing and torturing its finest. As Yassin has reminded us in his recent article in Al-Jumhuriya, uh, 
the Syrian tragedy crystallizes a global turning point in the securitization of politics. And he has introduced for us the concept of genocracy to capture the newly acceptable forms of exclusion based on race and kin that is built into authoritarian states as much as democracies and deliberately dilutes the basic proposition of democracy, namely popular sovereignty. The ensuing mass exodus of Syrians in 2015 has shaken the foundations of the Turkish state, the European Union, and the world order as a whole. It has brought out the best and the worst in people. Those who have learned from the past have opened up their homes in Germany, in Canada, and elsewhere. And those who have not have closed borders and attacked refugees. When he put in his book, We Cross the Bridge and a Tremble, available for purchase right here uh, after the lectures, contains moving and insightful Syrian testimonies. Testimonies that bring out the strength and resilience of the, of the Syrian people in their struggle against tyranny at home and adversity abroad. The book shows how feelings of home, exile and belonging have evolved in all sorts of unexpected ways. Russian and Assad's forces have ratcheted up their assault on Idlib province in recent weeks. Trump and Putin have all but approved Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights. And yet, there is a growing consensus, left, right and center, that military victory and the continuation of eternal Assad's rule is the lesser evil. We reject this logic, for might does not make right. Historical outcomes are not proofs of truth. Syrians in Canada stand at a crossroads. Four years into the arrival of the first refugees and newcomers, the first phase, or perhaps the first aid phase, is coming to a close. Young Syrians are beginning to enter Canadian universities, including this one. Some of them might be in the audience. As you are beginning to study and engage the world around you, your community is entering a new phase of life in Canada and outside of Syria. Now one of the reasons why we have decided to organize this event with Yassine and Wendy here and at this point in Syrian and Canadian history is that we wish to encourage you to reflect on what forms this new phase could take, what could be your roles in it, and what and to make connections with other Canadians who struggle for social justice. Yassine Hashsaleh draws on his experience in Germany and Turkey, but he's keen to learn about your experiences in Toronto. He wants to encourage everyone to honor the Syrian tragedy by thinking critically about its global dimension and by struggling for inclusive democracy in Syria and abroad. One of the difficulties in honoring the Syrian tragedy, I think, is that the revolution did not match the first principles of the traditional sympathizers of revolutionary struggle. Secularism as well as anti-Americanism, all align with Cold War geopolitics. The Syrian Solidarity Collective would like us to understand the uprising, the Syrian revolution, not in terms of deficits and deviations from a set path, but rather on its own terms. Let me introduce the two distinguished speakers and move into the second phase of this, of this evening's proceedings. Professor Wendy Perlman is a Harvard-trained professor of political science at Northwestern University. She has written on the politics of violence and non-violence in Palestine and on Israel's diplomatic violence against non-state actors in other states. Her award-winning book, We Cross the Bridge and They Tremble, Voices from Syria, was published two years ago, and it contains, as I said, heartbreaking testimonies of Syrian refugees from across Europe and the Middle East. Her research was made uh, possible in part by her Alexander von Humboldt Foundation Research Fellowship. 
when he was a fellow at the Forum Transfer General Studien in Berlin during the summers of 2016, 17, and 18, where she and Yassin and I overlapped. She will talk about the refugee crisis, a kaleidoscope of Syrian perspectives. Yassin Hassan, who received his MD at the University of Aleppo, was a Syrian political prisoner from 1986 to 2000, 2001. During the revolution, he was in hiding and managed to flee to Istanbul in 2012. There, he set up. Huh? 13. 13, I do apologize. <laughs> there, he set up the influential Syrian online journal, Andrumuria, which continues to serve as a platform for leftist Syrians to articulate their vision for a democratic Syria. Yassin has received the Dutch Prince Klaus Award and the Swedish Tucholsky Prize. Yassin has been a fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg zu Berlin since 2017, where we have become friends. He is the author of The Impossible Revolution, Making Sense of the Syrian Tragedy, also available over here at the desk, published by Haymarket Press two years ago. Yassin will talk to us about the Syrian revolution and the democratic age. Please help me welcome Yassin and then Wendy Perlman. Killed under torture, or were killed by torture, actually, 
you find almost all. In the past, we found every day in the uh, American press, and on the other country. The Americans were traveling to Syria all the time. Now, the different thing. Just after 2014, we were with boots on the ground and with their uh, uh, Air Force. So the only intervention that we have not seen in Syria is the one that systematically targets the region, either to effect political transition or to force the region to act, to do, to, to uh, uh, and and serious negotiations. So I conclude from this that it is a tautology to say that Syria is part of the world. Yes, Syria is part of the world, Canada is part of the world. But, however, to build on the above that the world is an integral part of Syria is not only meaningful in my opinion, is not only meaningful statement, but also the basis of any sustainable solution of the Syrian side. I conclude from the above as well that Syria is important because when we talk about Syria, we are talking about the world. Uh, or to put it differently, Syria is part, is the part of the world, maybe the only one today whose study gives us glimpses into some new processes and structures of the world today. So now in the time remaining, I will talk about these structures and the first thing is we warmly cherish the victims of the Holocaust and the Nazi genocide. It is not the case for us. The criminal is recognized as legitimate and normalized. The survivors are always under pressure to prove that they are not very bad. The victims are simply forgotten. Our traumas are not here and we are denied one more. As a Syrian, I have been asked so many times, what is the solution to Syria? I even replied, and I hope I have shown here that it is no longer about Syria, it's about the war. And Syria is by no means authoritative in answering this question. When we have five occupation powers in the country and foreign non-state actors as their proxies, the problem in Syria is international and the solution should be international. But when the international is so corrupt, sectarian and Syrianized itself, it is important to ask the question. What's the solution in the world? I think we need a new analysis, a new vision, a new project, a new other say, a new utopia. For many, our world today, for many, our world today is poisoned by growing worldless, worldlessness and this uh, uh, concept introduced by Anaya, homelessness and helplessness, uh, 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 plagued by uh, worldlessness and the world, that it introduces these itself. And this is already darkening uh, uh, our prospects and so it sees our nihilism. Jihadism is our version of nihilism, and it withdraws meaning from the world, like all humans, withdraw meaning from the world in the name of God, our jihadi uh, 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 allowing these the almighty agents to do whatever they want to do. But aren't we witnessing the gross effect of the rules and values by the powerful without even voices of protest from those who can speak and protest? The war the Russians boasted only a few days ago that they uh, uh, tried hundreds of uh, their weapons in Syria. Uh, some of them were not very good and covered people, so they did not do that. But the majority of the weapons were quite good and effective, and they were uh, uh, they were not very much. And I believe they were not They were exempt from any any intelligent laws. So when everything is permitted for anybody, why should it be permitted to everybody? And this is the help. This is the everything is permitted. You can do whatever you want. Many things that we are we can do now. Fatalism is in the form of nothing can be done or touches by the touches in a 
cosmologies do not mean. There is no whatever. Uh, so precarism and this form uh, and, and, and uh, the form of nothing can be done or Tina, uh, there's no alternative, is going presently hand in hand with Nicobin. Where everything is permitted, sorry, yeah, they are going hand in hand. Be, uh, Besides ter uh, terrorism, besides terrorism, it takes the form of consumerism, absolute nationalism, and destroying the planet. People of, uh, in Toronto and Canada are not far away from the nihilist, fatalist dynamics at work on the global law. Things will be better only when growing numbers of people become active and struggle against despair and self-destruction that are global nations. The world today is a macro Syria, and Syria is only a micro -cosm. Thank you. Refugee crisis means for refugees themselves. 
and especially those sourced from Syria. So taking on this question, I'll try to complement Nassim's insight. Nassim encouraged us to situate Syria globally, to think about Syria in the world. I look inward to personal reflections, to intimate stories about how individuals have been transformed by the dynamics that Nassim described. And of course, Nassim will be the first to say that the connection between this personal and political is always there. So here, talking about these personal reflections on the refugee crisis, I begin with something I was told from a Syrian or something, from Aleppo, who's now in Germany, who said, a refugee is not a type of person. It's a type of situation. And his message was to those of us who've never been forced from our homes, hey, this could happen to you too. It's a situation that could happen to anybody. Um, and especially when you never imagine it could happen to you, it could happen to you too. But his comment made me wonder, for those who have been forced to flee, what about this refugee situation is a crisis? So let me share with you just some of the crises that I see as problems of the floor in the story that I've left over the years. So first, of course, there's the crisis of making a home in a new place, what some might call integration, that loaded word. And here, in many home societies, especially in Europe and the U.S., maybe not in multicultural Canada, um, we have a lot to learn, there's an obsession about culture and religion, about how Arab Islamic newcomers present a threat to local values and traditions. By contrast, in the interviews I've collected with refugees talking about how integration is a crisis for them, what I hear most frequently are struggles about bureaucracy, about language, about housing, about work, about being able to work again in the profession or the occupation that you may have dedicated years of your life back on the period of developing getting a certificate and diploma. Will you ever work in that occupation again? There's a crisis out there again and again. So these experiences of integration are what makes the crisis vary tremendously by generation and also by socioeconomic class, which I think don't give enough attention. So there's the crisis of making a home in a new place. There's another crisis, which is perhaps one of the greatest sources of pain I find in the story that I collected, which is the separation from family and loved ones. As one woman told me, I don't feel displaced from Syria as much as I feel displaced from my family. Her parents and siblings are now scattered over multiple countries and multiple continents. My sound familiar to many of you too. The people I met who are actively seeking to obtain citizenship or permanent residency in their host country was the key reason to simply be able to travel and see your family in other countries. This hints at something of that hierarchy of passports that you see wrote about in his recent piece, and the, the kind of discrimination you see in airports, which hits people in the most intimate of ways, the hierarchy of passports that allows you to see your loved ones or not. A third crisis, a refugee crisis from refugee eyes, relates to the word refugee itself. Depending on your point of view, the word refugee can be a stigma, a stereotype, a political lightning rod for political debates and competitions, or a legal claim to rights. It is loaded with layers of connotations that fluctuate over time and place. To the degree that this same person perceives the word refugee as positively or negatively, they might come to see themselves in it or find it mainly a source of problems or even a source of crises. In my observations, in my conversations, I've seen both trends. Take here two voices from Berlin. Perhaps the most powerful assertion of an identification with the word refugee was one I encountered from a Palestinian Syrian. Refugee status was essential for his self-understanding long before he fled Damascus. Thereafter, it remained a pillar of his political identity. This is what he told me. He said, I was born as a refugee. My father was born a refugee. My grandfather was kicked out of Ecta. So now I'm a refugee for the third time. I don't have a problem with this word. I defend this word. I am with this word. Some people now prefer to use newcomer. I don't like newcomer. It doesn't mean anything. Refugee. 
being, seek refuge, and find shelter. But newcomer means that you just came. Refugee is a legal category with legal benefits given to you by law. Newcomer hits the politics out of it. That's one perspective. Here's a different perspective from another young Syrian woman who preferred the word newcomer. And he said, today the word refugee is used in a horrible way. It's something either to be pitied or to be blamed for everything. Overpopulation, it's the refugee. Red going up, it's the refugee. Crime, it's the refugee. If you label people refugees, they remain refugees for the rest of their lives. For that reason, we say newcomers. After a while, they're no longer newcomers. They're just members of society. Many of experience I've met during my three summers in Germany expressed similar sensitivity to these negative connotations attached to the word refugee, as well as what seemed like relentless repetition of this word in the local media. As one person told me in 2018, who knows what the media even talked about before we got here? Thank goodness that the World Cup distracted attention for a while. <laughs> But then Germany got eliminated from the World Cup. <laughs> now it's back to refugees, refugees, refugees. In a different way, I noticed similar sentiments among the so-called successful refugees. For example, many displaced Syrian creatives and cultural producers were exhausted with what they saw as the patronizing praise or tokenizing inclusion of being treated not as artists, but as refugee artists. They likewise recoiled from the term. In these and other ways, one odd aspect of the refugee crisis is just the word refugee itself. On to another crisis. This, I would say, is the crisis of individuals' relationship to the question of return. And here I'm not talking about the crisis of deportation, Forceful return of refugees to Syria, like we've seen in Turkey and Lebanon, which we've seen alluded to as well. This is clearly a violation of international law that puts people in the greatest danger. Nor am I referring to those Syrians who feel compelled to go back to Syria because they can no longer survive the harshness or the expensiveness of refugee life, especially in the border countries. That anyone would find war and ruthless dictatorship to be more secure than the circumstances in countries opposed to opposition <coughs> is the greatest failure of international politics. For sure, these are the real ways the question of return to the refugee crisis. However, I'd like to talk about a more quiet, emotional question about return. To explain, when I first began interviewing Syrians in Jordan in 2012, they were technically refugees, in the sense that they were outside their home country due to well-founded fears of persecution. Yet few viewed themselves as such. Most considered themselves to have traveled, traveled just a matter of kilometers in temporary search of safety. In their own sense of themselves and the world, they weren't refugees. They were just waiting. I found similar sentiments the following year when I interviewed people in Turkey. People lived in the barest of apartments, not only due to economic hardship, which was real, but also because there was a sense that there was no use buying things when any day the regime would fall and people would head home. Over time, clearly, things changed. I remember when I first began to hear whispers about migration to Europe. First, there were vague rumors about embassies offering visas. Then, stories about boat journeys that just seemed impossible to believe at the time. And then gradually, the same people who told those unbelievable stories were themselves crossing the sea. Now an increasing number have children who are born abroad or children who play with their siblings in a foreign language, or as young men said, now moving on and enrolling in college. With each of these steps of time, 
and geography, something shifted. What changed was not necessarily people's hope of returning home. What changed was the degree to which they assumed they would just be heading home. This, I propose, is critical in their very thinking about themselves as refugees or as displaced persons. Regardless of whether they met the definition set by international law, many did not come to see themselves as refugees until they reached the point when they no longer took for granted that they would make their future in Syria. That happened for different people at different times, and it was not automatic in simply crossing the border. And as that expectation of return shifted, so did individuals' relationship to the label refugee and the lead in a relationship to something called refugee crisis. Similar dynamics could have told with those who left Syria on student visas or on tourist visas and then found themselves unable to go back and perhaps instead faced with the decision of whether or not to apply for asylum where they were. Only then did some find themselves confronted with the question, am I a refugee? Does this refugee crisis thing apply to me, too? This might even resonate with some of you in the room. Let me share with you the words of Hagia. She doesn't use the word refugee at all, but she gives voice to this overlooked crisis that accompanies the shift from full <coughs> expectation that you're just going to make your life in Syria to a new sense that one's place has come to be on the outside rather than the inside. So this is her story, and I'll read it a bit at length. And she said, I went to the U.S. in 2010. No one had any intention of staying. We were happy to have this opportunity and then go back home. And then the revolution began. I tried very, very hard to get all the details I could from my cousins and my brother who were in Damascus. I had this first thirst to know, for I could pretend that I was living through their story. And school people kept telling me, at least you're safe. That word, safe, drove me crazy. I wanted to scream, you don't get it. This is a historic moment. I need to be there. My mom and dad both got visas to visit the U.S for my graduation. My mom was planning on staying only a month. But while she was here, the regime started bombing just minutes from our home. We kept postponing her return ticket. We never thought that she'd stay this long. And mom always said she came with one suitcase and never said goodbye to people. Winter came and I told my mom Let's go get you a coat. She said, I can't believe I'm going to buy things while people are dying in Syria. I said, we have to. It's Chicago, and it's cold. She said, but I have all those coats in Syria. It's the small things like that. They become like rocks on your chest. My role is different from people on the inside, but I need to do something too. I have this responsibility to tell the story, to say what's happening on the other side of the world. There are many more crises than these that I've mentioned, but as a final crisis, I'd like to discuss the crisis of belonging. Increasingly in my interviews, I'm finding that the most interesting question is also the most heart-wrenching. Who has asked to, to be in your mess? To what do you feel that you belong? The question of belonging is tremendously difficult because it's intertwined with the question of what makes something feel like home, or alternatively, alternatively like anybody. In academic writing, Exile is conventionally viewed as a painful uprooting from an idealized homeland. But what does <coughs> exile mean when that homeland is saturated not only with warm attachment, but with pain? The voices that I've collected over the years reiterate how many forced to flee Syria yearn for their loved ones, the familiar spaces, the cultural affinities of their country. 
country of birth. One man journey told me, even the fruit tasted sweeter there. Here, life has no flavor. Yet many recall authoritarian rules, an alienation, him and God. <coughs> and among them, of course, continued writings on this topic stand out. Many people with whom I spoke identified the revolution, and especially its onset, as something that transformed their supposed homeland into a true home, offering dignity and solidarity. As protests evolved and the war took root, many felt displaced not only by their homeland, but also the dream of creating a new homeland. For them, becoming a refugee from the crossing the border was thus not the start of exile. It was one step in a long, difficult struggle for a true home in which to be one's true free self. So how are displaced Syrians dealing with this refugee crisis? Where are they finding belonging and home? This is clearly a story that is still being written, and many of you are writing it, and it's something that I'm especially eager to keep tracking over the years. But for now, in the spirit of kaleidoscope, let me share with you just three voices offering different perspectives. One, Yasmin, who's now in tears. She said, we said goodbye to our country. I was not going to return until it became homeland for me again. What's the homeland? It's not rocks and trees. It's the humans who build the land. It's where you feel safe. The homeland is a friend with whom you work and drink coffee every morning. And that friend betrayed me for a little money or a better position. I didn't betray my homeland. It betrayed me. I didn't leave my homeland. It left me. It pushed me to leave. When the revolution of corruption turned into a worldwide war, I couldn't consider it a homeland anymore. It became a grave where you died slowly. In my country, I fulfilled my duties, but didn't receive my rights. Here in Sweden, I fulfill my duties and get rights in return. That's what homeland means. My three children have become holders of European nationalities. In the future, I'll have grandchildren who speak Dutch, Swedish, and Spanish. If they don't learn Arabic, they'll be strangers to each other. They won't have any traces of where they came from. They won't be Syrian, and I will live in exile and die in exile. That's one. Two, Fedwell in Germany. Okay. In the old days, the side of that rule, that's what we call exile. But I'm living in the middle of Berlin. How can you say I'm living in exile? I feel so happy here. You feel like your humanity is protected and respected by the law. I'm always thinking about these comparisons. I would love to see all these things here in Europe also exist in Syria. That's my dream. Why do we have public transportation in Europe? Why is it that here I can walk down the street and speak what's on my mind in public without fear? I think about how I wanted to live this kind of life, but live it in Syria. Syria, where my memories are, or my memories of my childhood, my life, the streets and the roads I used to walk down, the hospital where I gave birth to my son. To me, homeland means that inheritance that I'm always marrying. My memories and my childhood, that's what homeland is for me. <coughs> and the third voice, my aunt from Lebanon. We're in Lebanon now. She said, I belong deeply to my hometown because that's where my memories are. There's a woman sitting and making her oven. She doesn't know me but says, come, my dear, and eat. There's a small stream flowing through the town. There are gardens and peaches and blueberries. There's something about this town that I just can't leave behind. But Syria, I don't feel any sense of belonging to Syria. They ruined our belongings. Now I'm 
travel things or any Western country where I would be welcomed and respected. I want someone to tell me to stay and build here. I want to build. I can build. Maybe I belong to my people. Maybe my stay in Lebanon has made me very sensitive for the Syrian cause, for the Syria. This is the issue that's killing me day after day. Every day I see Syrian getting insulted. Every day I see a miserable Syrian. Every day I see a deprived Syrian. Every day I see a broken woman. I see people becoming more backwards. I see it every day, every day, every day. So maybe my belonging has become stronger to Syria and not to Syria. My belonging to Syria, my country, is over. But still, I wish I could go back and rebuild. I'll end here with more on these words because the sense of belonging carries clashes and flashing layers of pain and yearning and hope that hint at some of the complexity of the Syrian refugee crisis for Syrian refugees themselves. Zuzan no longer feels belonging to Syria, yet he cannot put it behind him. He wishes to return, but he also wishes to move even further away. He sees an exile of impoverishment and degradation of many of his fellow Syrians, but this only strengthens his identification with that of the people and the cause. Though seemingly contradictory, these feelings are all logical outgrowths of the cruelty and harshness of being forced to flee what you see described to us as democratic oppression and genocidal violence. And this pain and cruelty all mixed together with hope is perhaps the most fundamental refugee crisis of all.